Well, there are days when, as Vice-Chancellor, you don't particularly like to open the paper. And this morning when I opened the paper, I knew I was going to be in trouble from both our government relations people and our media relations people, because there was a headline that said, University Vice-Chancellor rails against stupidity in the innovation sphere. Well, I think this morning there have been so many interesting and, in some senses, contradictory ideas about innovation that it's almost impossible not to say something stupid, so I'll be careful. I want to say something briefly, having listened to the panel, about the distinctive place of universities in the innovation chain. Because that's my day job, that's the area where I think this institution has been and needs to show national leadership. And I, as I listened to the panel, it seemed to me that there were three things that were very important to remember. The first was that a university needs to do that kind of innovation that you can't do in your garage. A university needs to do the kind of innovation that you cannot easily do in your garage. Oh, our students have garages, and students in California have done remarkable things over the last 10 or 20 years in garages, inventing Facebook and all the rest of it. But our researchers are doing a different kind of work. Thomas Mushmeyer and I recently saw a senior politician. He said, it's very great to see the boring men in suits from universities mixing with the groovy young things in t-shirts because our innovator Thomas was sitting next to a young man in a t-shirt. I wanted to lean over and say minister, minister, because it was a minister, minister, actually Thomas Mushmeyer has about a quarter of a billion dollars of startups to his credit. He's invented a biofuel that could change the way that we, um, that, that we do energy. He's invented battery technology that will save the planet. The guy in the white t-shirt has invented an app that flogs wine, right? <laughs> that you can do in your garage. In order to change the planet, you need these kind of facilities and you may need to be working in an environment where you have fundamental science, where you have applied science, where you have science across the disciplines, where you have science in conversation with the humanities, where you have the rich intellectual capital of an institution like this. So a university needs to contribute to the innovation chain in its distinctive place, the stuff you can't do in your garage. The second thing that occurred to me as I listened to the panel was that there is a false distinction often drawn between purposive and, it, uh, purposive and serendipitous innovation and that actually the most interesting work probably happens somewhere in the middle. Um, Alan Finkel talked about the remarkable work that's gone on uh, at Rio Tinto in automated mining. And of course, a lot of that has come out of our Australian Centre for Field Robotics that's been working very closely with um, Rio Tinto, amongst others, in the workerless mine technology area. And that's been very purposive, commissioned research. And yet so much of what has come out of universities has happened not only because of the mistakes people make, but also because of the things they discover when they are involved in projects that are eventually, for one reason or another, fail. The serendipitous stories that university researchers love so much. But it was great to hear Norm talk about the Microsoft approach because it seems to me that that's where we need to be moving as institutions. Microsoft are tremendous partners for us because they're very keen on publications in peer-reviewed journals, just as keen as they are in, on patents. Very keen in blue sky research, just as they are on applied research. But yes, it starts with a business case. It starts with the notion that these questions that we are asking are important questions, either commercially or socially, and that then we'll let our imaginations rip. On the way through, we're going to be asking all sorts of questions to which we not only don't know the answers, but didn't know that they were questions five minutes ago. So it's neither purposive, if you apply this known technology to this known problem, you will get an answer, nor is it merely let me sit down with a blank sheet of paper. It's a creative partnership a creative partnership with commercial and civil society organisations that says, here's an area of activity where we know there is a business case because we know that there is an opportunity. Or here's an area of activity where they, we know that there is a significant social problem that needs answering. Let's work together 
in blue skies, serendipitous kind of in more purposive projects as we think about realizing the remarkable potential of the intellectual capital of places like this. We've got to do what you can't do in your garage. We've got to explore that middle territory of research that is neither purposive in the strict sense nor merely blue sky, but, but research that though blue sky always has the issues that the society and that the commercial world are facing more generally. And third, as I listened to the panel, it became more and more clear that my day job and the day job of the people across the university is essentially talent management. If you put clever people together, things happen. And university vice chancellors love to say, we have started this remarkable in, um, initiative in X or Y or Z. What mostly happens is you discover you've got a network of people who have found one another and are working together and good ideas bubble up from the top. And then the most you can do is not get in the way of them doing their remarkable work, but actually supporting it and watching it begin to grow. And they will know that this kind of innovation is effectively a team sport. That's why the centerpiece of this um, uh, uh, um, couple of days launch of the Institute has not been this breakfast. It's been an academic, um, academic meeting of scientists drawn from all over the world thinking about issues in nanoscale science and research. Our distinctive place and the distinctive place that I hope both the Australian taxpayer and Australian industry will support in the innovation chain is really the stuff that you can only do in remarkable institutions like this with their extraordinary intellectual capital. Um, it's work nevertheless that we need to do with the needs of our community constantly in mind. But ultimately it's work that will happen if you put together um, people like Thomas or Zdenka or Ben Eggleton or David or Michael, um, Michael Bersouk, as you, as, as, as you put those people together in facilities like this, you see things happen. That's what it is my privilege to watch every day at the University of Sydney. And that's why I'm sick, absolutely sick, of politicians, media commentators, of whatever, saying the problem with Australia's innovation is the universities, or the universities saying, the problem with Australia's innovation is business, because every day I watch university and business and other civil society organisations bring together talented people and enable them to make a real difference, not only but for Australia, but also for the wider world. Inno the innovation game is an exciting one, and it's one that we play every day here at the University of Sydney. So thank you very much for um, joining with us to celebrate the remarkable creativity of an institution like this. Thank you for um, joining us to celebrate what we think is a historic occasion in the launch of the Australian Institute for Nanoscale Science and Technology. And we commit as an institution to occupying with you that middle space as, um, as industry and commerce and the university together set their minds to the problems and opportunities that are facing our country and our globe. Thank you very much.